All right, I hope everyone is doing fantastic this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining us online. I've got three things I want to talk about real quick before we jump into tonight's um, going deeper practical discipleship message. One is, again, I just want to reiterate the National Day of Prayer. Our nation needs prayer. Um, God, Guys, we need God in America uh, like never before. Um, and I would just ask you, please pray, consider if you can, Meeting here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. We're going to have um, pastors from several local churches who are going to be participating. Uh, I think we are going to broadcast that, but there's just something special that happens when the saints gather. Um, it's going to be a good time. We're going to have some praise and some worship. I promise you it won't be super long, but um, I think it will be super powerful. So I would encourage you, please consider being a part of that, number one. Number two... Our good friend, Alex McFarlane, is going to be coming. And I don't know if, you, if you're not familiar with Alex, I would encourage you to check out Truth for a New Generation. Just Google Alex McFarlane, and you'll see he is a very well-known, very effective apologist and um, an evangelist. And I believe that uh, uh, the, uh, the gift of evangelism is something that we need in the church and we will need in the, in the coming days in an unprecedented way. Uh, I think we need to be on the, on the front end of that. So he's going to be coming on the 21st, and he's going to be speaking to our youth, middle, middle school, high school, college age. He's got a message that he's preparing just for you guys. So if you have children um, in that demographic, middle school, again, through college, I would, in, I would encourage you, please consider making that a priority. We're going to ask him to address some of the real issues that, that, are, that we're facing at earlier and earlier ages in our, in our uh, public education system and in our culture. And we want to we equip them with powerful answers. So please consider that. Also, he's going to be here on Saturday, the 22nd. We're having a special meeting. Uh, we're calling it a, it's EE. It's not... Um, it's evangelism essentials. So we're going to be going over, and he's going to be doing a session actually from 9 a.m. to 12 uh, on evangelism essentials. And we're going to try to break that up into three easy sessions. Some of it is going to be question and answer and panel style, and some of it is going to be just Alex sharing from his heart on what he deems to be evangeliz evangelism essentials. Um, and last uh, is the month of June. And I've wanted to do this for a long time, but... Um, over the course of the last 15 or so 20 years of, of doing pastoring, I've had the opportunity to do quite a bit of marriage counseling and counseling in general. And I developed what I refer to as my marriage and relationship toolbox. Uh, in it are biblical principles that if you utilize in the context of your relationship, they can be very, very powerful. You know, I, I, I say it this way. If you want to build something beautiful, you, you have to start with the right tools. And what I want to do is over the course of June, uh, every Thursday night in June, beginning at 7 o'clock from 7 to probably about 8.30, um, we're going to open up and I'm going to have a four-week workshop on marriage and relationship. Uh, maybe, maybe you've got this thing figured out. Um, maybe you know somebody who doesn't. But I would encourage you, we're going to announce it this weekend, so this is a shot over the bow. You're hearing something that nobody else has heard quite yet except for the people online. We are asking that you would sign up for this, not necessarily because of limited space, but we want to put some material in your hands, and we need to know, you know how, much, how many syllabuses to, to print out and, and whatever. But I think it's going to be good stuff. Um, we've really wanted to do some things, and I just feel like marriage is one of those things that a single conference won't do. And even relationships and learning how to navigate relationships is not something you could do within the context of a single conference. So, so doing this over the course of a month and, and as a series, we will be videoing it. It will be broadcast. We are going to probably produce, you know, it'll, it'll be a little different experience. Just pray about that, and hopefully that's something that God will use to help us grow deeper in relationship with him and with each other and just get better at doing that. Um, let's pray, and we'll get started. Father... You are good, you're merciful, your word contains so much wisdom, and we ask you tonight for understanding. God, I'm going to ask you to please open the eyes of our understanding in, in ways maybe that we've never experienced. Father, we don't, we don't want to do this evening without you, but I ask, Holy Spirit, again, please prepare our hearts to receive what you would say to us individually and corporately this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, 
Eric, this past weekend, who I think personally did an incredible job, he spoke about the, yeah, hey man, he did, he did, very proud of him. He spoke about the, the attributes of a disciple. And, and something happens, when we, when we put on Christ, we are called to not just put him on theoretically, but put him on by personifying, now think about that word, personifying his very attributes. Not only when we put on Christ are we called to personify his, his attri- attributes, we also have responsibilities that we are to put on as well. So tonight, as we go deeper in the idea of the attributes of a disciple, I want to look at some of, and as Eric said Sunday, this is, not, this is by no means a comprehensive list of the responsibilities of a disciple, but if we're going to go deep, there's some things that we need to embrace deeply. Did you hear that? If we're going to go deeper, it's only going to be when we embrace things more deeply. So I want to talk to you just a little while this evening on responsibilities of a disciple. Disciples have responsibilities that are to be fulfilled to our master. You know, whenever we, we talk like this, I think about the old kung fu movies. Anybody ever watch the old kung fu movies? It's like the kung fu movies and spaghetti westerns. To me, they are like incredibly inspiring. Um, annoying, low budget make, but anyway, uh, in, in, the, in the kung fu movies, they really personified very often you would see a, a, a disciple, a student who would come and he would be in this dilemma. You know, the narrative is, is the same in so many of those kung fu movies where this guy really gets beat up and he realizes he, he wants to get revenge and he wants to fight back. So he, he comes and finds a master and he's like, teach me, master. And the master's like, no, I'm not going to teach you. And then rejects him. And then he puts him through this series of absolute torture. And, and finally, you know, the attributes of the master is produced in the disciple. And then he goes out and kung fus everybody and dies in the process. And that's your, that's your kung fu movie. Anyway, it's a little different with Christianity. So, I, so when I speak on terms, think about it. Think about that in the back of your mind. It is that disciple who said to that master, here I am, whatever you say, I'm all in with. No matter how ridiculous it may sound, no matter how counterculture it may be, no matter how much I may or may not understand the why I'm going to engage in the what. Now, in the Kung Fu movies, it was because he saw the incredible ability of the master and trusted that he could somehow take on those attributes and personify and get the same effects that, that the Kung Fu master will. With, with Christ, it's a, it's a little bit different. He is our high priest. He is our model. He is our example. But in the same way, he is also our master. And we are to to, um, unwaveringly and unquestionably submit to the way of the master. Anyway, um, there are some responsibilities, and there's four of them that I want to talk about this evening. And one of the responsibilities as disciples is to be the bridge and, and this is going to take a little bit of, a, of an explanation, and it's going to take a, a, a little bit of scripture reading. But we have a responsibility to know people, to reach people, and to interact with people as the Master did. Now, it's, a unique, it's unique in the New Testament. There's never been anything quite like it um, in creation. The call to be the bridge. I want to read something to you out of 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 21. It says, So from now on... Now, this is a, I want you to catch this. This is a a definitive moment that Paul is calling the church to say, as of right now, because he was dealing with some stuff. He was bringing, he was was explaining some stuff. He was, I'm not going to say he wasn't exactly executing church discipline, but he said, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view or an earthly perspective. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, you realize that literally people walked and had relationship with Jesus Christ as one man may have with another. Limited perspective of that relationship. But he said, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. What does that mean? What is the result of that? You know, those two little dots at the end of the word come there have changed my life. We're going to see those throughout the scripture and we're going to break it up into sections. But a description or a list 
follows is what those two little dots mean anytime you, you, you see them in a sentence. Therefore, if anyone is, is in Christ, the new creature has come. And he says what that means is the old has gone and the new is here. And, and, and the truth is, uh, Paul understood this. We will never walk in the new until we absolutely abandoned, abandon the old. He's talking about here in context our, our view of how we see each other and how we interact with each other. You will never be the bridge to people that God's called you to be if you continue to look at them from a worldly perspective and not a heavenly paradigm. You won't see them as objects of God's mercy. You'll see them as catalysts of your frustration. Right? So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. This is the, the true disciple perspective and responsibility. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Change, not in the way we see, but the perspective from which we see. He continues, he says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, and here's the responsibility that I'm talking about, here's the responsibility to be the bridge, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? You see the two dots again, right? So he's going to give us that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Now, that ministry of reconciliation means the service or the labor of reconciliation. This is the labor that he did and wants to continue through us. As we accept our responsibility, this is what is accomplished. The ministry or the labor or the work or the service of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to him in Christ. Not counting people's sin against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So the ministry of reconciliation. Christ is the means or the catalyst of reconciliation. Forgiveness by God through Christ is the work that he has completed and he's asked us to carry on. He continues, we are therefore, and this again, responsibility, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Now, I want you to hear the, hear the terminology here. As though God were making his appeal through us. You talk about a responsibility, you understand, and that's, that's the definition of an ambassador. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God himself were making his appeal through us. Now you understand how we're the bridge. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Now how do we do that? And how do we implore the people? What is that, what is that message of reconciliation that is the result of having the responsibility of, of the, of the uh, ministry of reconciliation, see the two dots. Here's our message. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is our message. The ministry is what he's done. We carry that on. It's carried out. It will continue to be carried out through Christ as our high priest. He made it possible our bridge is the bridge that we become to people on God's, in God's stead is, is to connect people with that reality, the message of reconciliation. We, disciples, are the bridge of expression for reconciliation between God and man. I want to say that one more time, and I want you to hear the complexity and the truth and the responsibility in that statement. We, as disciples, are the bridge of expression for reconciliation between God and man. I didn't say the mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Did you understand? How will they hear except someone tells them? This is our job. The message as a result of the ministry of reconciliation to implore people as if... Now, how many times have you stood before someone and, and, the, and the Spirit of God rose up on the inside of you to, to the degree that you knew 
that if God himself was standing, and I've said that to somebody, I've said if, if Jesus Christ himself were standing here before you right now, this is what he would say. And you say, Pastor Tony, that's arrogant. And how do you know that? Because what I was telling them was exactly what the word of God says. And we're going to get to that in just, in just a moment. But guys, that is the absolute reality that if we don't embrace, we will never exemplify. If we don't understand that and walk in that, it says when you speak, you speak as an oracle of God, an inspired representative, an ambassador. And, and, not just, and, and again, that's why I, I'm repeating that is because an ambassador, as though God himself in your flesh were appealing to them. To be reconciled to God. This is a little bit of a paradigm shift that is kind of difficult to embrace. So is this important? You bet your... Yes. It is important. The greatest responsibility any person could ever have is the difference between eternal life and death. That is the ministry of reconciliation. We're not talking about people getting along. We're not even talking about nations not warring. We're talking about life and death, heaven and hell. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about man being reconciled, outside of which there's absolutely no hope. And everything you do will die on this earth with you if the reconciliation doesn't occur. And God is going, how will they hear if you don't go? It is the utmost when it comes to priority. And, and how he made it so simple that God is no longer meeting out judgment for your sins because of Christ Jesus, will you accept and embrace that reality? Think about the simplicity of that. That is the, the simplicity and the power of the gospel. That Jesus is no longer meeting out the penalty for your sins on you if you will simply embrace this reality and be reconciled through the meter outer, the one upon it, which it was meted out. The punishment was placed, Jesus Christ. It's good news. So responsibility of a disciple, number two, and, and these, are, these are the components of that. Number one is, again, be the bridge God's called us to be. And number two is to know, to know the master. How can, we, how can we tell someone of whom we do not know becomes the question. See, knowing Jesus personally and intimately is the greatest invitation that's ever been offered to humanity. The God of the universe would want to know us. Again, knowing Jesus personally and intimately is the greatest invitation ever offered to humanity. We must know the master to which, guys, there is absolutely no higher calling or higher opportunity. That is a responsibility. We have a responsibility to intimately know whom we represent. And you, you would think that if I call him master, he, he asked this several times. He said, why do you call me teacher? Why do you call me master, yet you don't do what I say? They didn't know him. There's, there's something that happens there. We're going to get to that in just a minute. We must know the master. There's no higher calling. All of Christ's power was out of the overflow of the relationship with his Father, that's why it's so important for us to know the master. All of your power, all of your effectiveness, everything that you are. Jesus said it this way, if you abide in me and I abide in you, then the life that I have will flow through you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Overflow to know the master. Great responsibility of the disciple. John 1.10 says it this way. He was in the world. And, and these are some, some verses that I want you to really consider when we talk about knowing the master. He was in the world and the world came into being through him. And yet the world, listen to this, did not know him. Did not recognize, did not, listen to this, even acknowledge him correctly. Now, what does that mean? I believe there's three warnings here that we need to really, we need, we need to really glean. Number one, not recognizing who he is doesn't change who he is. He was the creator. He was unrecognized and unrecognizable to the world because of their, their blinded eyes. And we'll get into why they were blinded in just a second. But it didn't change who he was. The reality was, whether you acknowledge it or not, the master, creator, maker of all the heavens and earth walked on this earth and, and, and tented, tabernacled, as the King James would say, with us for a while. 
Even though, think of the people who walked by. So consumed in the day with their businesses and everything else that God himself walked by them and they never even thought about it. See, I'm going to tell you this. When he said to the disciples, go saying the kingdom of God is at hand, do you realize every time you walk by it, whether you realize it or they realize it, if you are a disciple, the kingdom of God has come near them. Not only the kingdom of God, but, but all of the attributes of the kingdom of God, all the power, all the deliverance, all of the reconciliation, forgiveness, love, joy, and peace of the kingdom of heaven has come near, yet people may not even recognize it. And they certainly will never recognize it if we never verbalize it. When's the last time you walked up to somebody and said, I want to tell you something. Brother, sister, the kingdom of God is right here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Righteousness, peace, and joy, truth, and wisdom, they are right here in front of you. Will you listen? I'm just telling you, I know we don't take that approach. I know that's not popular evangelism, but what if we did that? What if we said, the God of the universe is here and attentive attributes and realities of heaven right here. What if, what, what if, we, what if we took on that, that paradigm, which I believe is consistent of, of being an ambassador of the ministry of reconciliation? Number two, wrong focus leads to wrong relationship. We don't want to be those people who are too caught up in this world to, to even recognize the maker of the world. And, it, it, and, and that happens. I'll be honest, very often I get so caught up in surviving. I get so caught up in, in raising my family. And, and, and can I be honest, doing church sometimes that I can miss the master of the church. I get so caught up in doing church that maybe I miss being the church. And what, what, what's one of the first signs? Well, well, well Pastor Tony, I'm, I'm, I don't have time to pray. Yeah, yeah. How about this one? And this is a warning. Christ is, off, Christ is often bigger than our context. See, because we see and we relegate Christ. We marginalize God. Not, not, and, and, and here's the danger, and here's the sad part. When we do it in our lives, we by, fault, by default do it in the lives of others. It doesn't even have to be intentional because it becomes at that point, it becomes at that point residual. Jesus said to them, this is John 14, 9, he said, Jesus said to him, have I been with you for so long a time and yet you have not come to me or come to know me intimately, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. Philip said to him, you know, listen, listen, the only thing we want you to do before you leave, one thing, just show us the Father. Let us see him as you have seen him. And this is Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you have not come to know me, Philip. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? That tells me, and this is scary, you can be very near him and still not know him. That, that, that's scary. I think about the people who have come in here, who have, who have heard the truth. Think about the people that you've impacted and you've spoke to and you've shared truth, God's truth, not your truth, not your perspective, God's perspective with them. And they've they've seen it, they've grasped it for a season or to a degree, and then they've, they've walked away and willingly left it behind and said, we prefer the darkness over the light. We prefer the darkness, the deception, and the pain that comes with the result of, of rejecting truth. So many people stood in the presence of God and didn't even know it. And one of his disciples had never through knowing the master plumbed the depths of who he really was. You can be near him and not know him. I want to give you uh, uh, a spectrum. And then I want you to ask yourself where you appear on this spectrum of knowing the master. Familiar? Friend? Or family? Family? Now, this is rhetorical. Don't, don't, this is introspective. When you think of how well and, and the responsibility that you have to know the master whom you, re, whom, whom you represent, and again, you will never represent fully who you do not know thoroughly. 
You will never represent fully or accurately who you do not know thoroughly. Are you familiar? Are you a friend? Or are you family? Or do you appear on that, on that spectrum? Last verse on, on this before we move on to the next one. Uh, 1 John 5, 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding. Knowing the Master is important. So that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son Jesus. And in the true God and eternal life. That helps us kind of change. And, and this is tough for those who may have a gift of teaching or a gift of ministering in some capacity, or, or, or just have a gift of knowledge. And when I say that, I mean functional. I, I don't mean a word of knowledge. I mean the, the proclivity of knowledge. The um, understanding and getting understanding in this verse. I want you to think about this. He said, with all of your getting, get, under, get understanding. Why? Because God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him. Understanding is for intimacy. Understanding ultimately from God's perspective is so that I might, I might position myself more effectively to know him more fully. That's what understanding is. This is the functional side of understanding. As a teacher sometimes... I, I want to get understanding so that I can help, help you know him, help you grow. I read the word of God and think out of it I can, I can birth a sermon or, or something because there's a little pressure on me to do that sometimes. I'm, I'm just telling you. Don't know where that comes from. I'm assuming it's all made up because it's, it's, it's not real, but it's real here. You know? But I can never forget, we can never forget the study that we're doing, the understanding that we're striving to receive. Is for intimacy with him first and foremost. We must first consume it. First ones, uh, the Bible says we must be first partakers. All right, number three. And this is a responsibility of the disciple. You, we have an obligation. Listen to this. We have an obligation. We have a living stewardship placed upon us as disciples of the master to know the truth. We have a response. We have an obligation to be stewards of the truth. Now, I'm not talking about watered down. I'm not talking about diluted. I'm talking about the truth. Truth, again, being synonymous with the word reality. We have an obligation and a stewardship of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this. Be, be diligent to present yourselves or yourself approved to God a work a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling, administering, utilizing, promoting, personifying the word of truth. Be diligent. Truth is, is the power or the keys to release the captive. He said this. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now, that not only works for us. I believe it has to work on us first and foremost. But that will also work in the lives of others. That's why he said, when you say, when you go say the, the kingdom of God is at hand and the truth that you deliver has in itself the capability, the potential, the dunamis, the power to bring, to bring freedom to, to whatever captivity that person you're standing in front of is facing. Counselors in, enjoy this. Christian counselors get to experience and see this, and, and, and it is incredibly fulfilling when you see somebody who's been operating in a deception, and that deception has, has, has crystallized in their life to the point that it has called, caused destruction and captivity, and you're able to see that deception, and then you're able to pull out that, that truth, the truth bomb, and explode that lie. Bust open the, the gates of their captivity by renewing their mind and saying, you know what, you don't have to be. This is a glass, this is a glass ceiling. This is a pretend, a pretend, a pretend prison. You'll know the truth, and, and the difference is you can, you can let go of that lie, and you can embrace this truth, and with that truth, just crush that thing. And seeing that aha moment when they realize it was their ignorance in accepting a lie of the enemy concerning them that has brought about their captivity or their problem, whether it's in their relationship or their lives or 
because they believed that holding on to a past hurt would somehow make them better or hurt the other person. Just a plethora of different things, but truth is the power or the keys to release the captive. We are to be exercised as disciples, followers of the master in truth. Now, knowing truth requires four things according to this verse. To, to really utilize effectively truth, four things. One, relationship. Relationship. And we, we learned that from the last verse. Number two, in this verse, it says be diligent. We understand that it requires diligence. So relationship. Why, why relationship? Let me back up for that for just, just a second. The re- reason... The reason Fully embracing and recognizing truth requires a relationship. Is, is, I'm going I'm to blow your minds here. Many of you know it because truth is a person. True or not? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. When, here's why truth is so powerful to, to, to setting captives free. is because when you walk in truth, you're, you're not walking in a state of mind. You're walking in a powerful presence. So when you're walking, you're living, you're executing, applying truth in your life, that truth out of the overflow will go through and it won't just set you free. It'll begin to bust people around you. Because truth, again, is a person. And that's why one of the requirements for really knowing and embracing effectively truth is relationship. Truth is a person. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when you say, I love truth, do you realize that truth for love is, is paramount? To a, true, to a love for God? On the same note, listen to this. When you, redre- when you reject truth, who are you rejecting? You're not rejecting a principle or a platitude. You're rejecting a person, but we don't see it that way. When you reject biblical truth, given either directly from the Word of God or through counsel or through wisdom or through inspiration of the Spirit, when you go the other way, you're literally not just walking away from truth, you're walking away from a person. Four requirements of knowing truth is one, relationship. Number two is diligence. He said, be diligent. I love that verse. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. You know, and I think that's something that we miss Diligence, and that's why that I'm just that he used the word disciple to describe us, which the root word is discipline. A disciple, a disciple is a disciplined follower of Christ. Self discipline, yeah, biblically discipline. So you, you hear diligence in that word. A requirement for knowing truth is that we be diligent to discover it and seek him out. Number three, understanding. Uh, th- this one's kind of big. Knowing truth, we talked about how understanding was for intimacy, but without that, that understanding to begin, again, he said, with all you're getting, get understanding, because it becomes very, very paramount, not just to grasp concepts of truth or to grasp glimpses of God. See, what truth holds are characteristics We'll call, we'll call truth the pigmentation of God. Looks a little different than, than what we might think. But when you see truth or reality, then you begin to see the goodness of God. You begin to see the mercy and the grace and the love and everything that God is is, is held there in immutable, unchanging truth. Love. So understanding requires understanding, because if you don't have understanding, you'll never have accurate application. See, truth, is, truth goes beyond just a understanding. It graduates to an application, and that's why those, those really go hand in hand. So relationship, diligence, understanding, and accurate application. Let me get back to the Word so that you'll bring all these together scripturally. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed accurately, Handling the Word of God. So you see where those four principles came from right there. Um, The Word of God, guess what the Word of God is? The Word of God is a, again, person, right? So that's why you can have truth. The Word of God to be truth. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So the accurate application of that. 
is there. Okay, last but not least, and I'll get you out of here. Thank you for your patience with some of my ramblings, but the fourth responsibility of a disciple, inescapable, again, at the top of the list, make disciples. Reproduction. When he said, be fruitful and multiply, listen, he was talking to us. He's talking to us today. That's an Old Testament law of the first mentioned principle that is replicated in every single disciple today. Should be. Old Testament shadow of New Testament. We were called to multiply. You were never called to be and exist alone. You were called to make disciples. That's why it was called the Great Commission. And, and all of us, if you've been saved for a moment, you know that. Go into all the world and make disciples. This is where we get our mission statement. Make, equip, and release fully committed followers, the functional definition of a disciple. So be the bridge. We do that by knowing people, understanding people, and being willing to be that bridge of reconciliation. Knowing the master, knowing truth, and never forgetting that one of our responsibilities is to make disciples. Guys, I hope there's been something here that has, has touched you some. The Word of God will accomplish what God intends it to do. I just want us to continue to grow. You know, we call this Wednesday night going deeper. I will tell you, next Wednesday we're going to be having a, a panel discussion um, up here. It's going to be kind of like it was last week. I'm not exactly sure about what the topic's going to be, but I think it's going to be good. Jeff, we know what that topic's going to be? Yeah, no, okay. So anyway, it's going to be good. Um, and we're going to have a special guest on that panel. He doesn't know it yet. He's in here tonight. Uh, so we, we love doing this to people. But we believe that, that you all have giftings. You all have callings. And out of the overflow of your relationship with God, out of the overflow of, of an abundance of the Word of God and the truth on the inside of you, that you can be a blessing and you can bring light and understanding and help and hope and encouragement to the rest of the body and anybody who might be here tonight who's not a member of the body. If you're here tonight and you're not a member of the body, if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus or you're here tonight and you're far from God and you're one of those people who, who know better but you're not doing better and the Holy Spirit is, is, is trying to get you to align those, I want to encourage you tonight. Take a step towards God. You say, why? Because if you move towards Him, I promise you, according to the Word of God, he will move towards you in a mighty way. Can I give you scripture? Draw near to me, says the Lord, and I will draw near to you. Guys, that's what this is all about. What if you really understood that the fate of many in this world depends on your nearness to the Master? Because the nearer you are to Him, the more effective you will be for Him. You hear me say this often. It's, it's my desire, and I believe it's God's desire, that we be everything God's called us to be so we can do everything God's called us to do. Amen. Father, God, we thank you for that truth, that word, which is Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have created us and called us to be ambassadors, rep representatives, as if you, in human form, in flesh form, were calling people to reconciliation. God, give us the grace, the mercy, and the boldness to represent you well, to carry the call, and to carry the name of Jesus Christ honorably and effectively. Draw us, Father God, to you in new and deeper ways. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Please consider joining us for the National Day of Prayer tomorrow, and God bless you.